Hello, we are the Exoplanet Transit team. Um, unfortunately, our first team, team member, Sol, is unable to make it, but I'm Caroline Kanoki. I am Nate Moretsky. I'm Noah McCormack. I'm Rama Musker. I'm Neha Nair. And I'm Neil Parajuri. We also have our corresponding author and mentor throughout this entire process, uh, Tom Rutherford. To begin, I'm going to start with an interesting fact. According to NASA, it is estimated that there is at least one planet for every star. A bit of background information, what exactly is an exoplanet? An exoplanet is a planet that does not orbit our sun, a planet that is, in other words, beyond our solar system. So what is an exoplanet transit? This video illustrates what an exoplanet transit is. It occurs when an exoplanet passes between its star and an observer. When this happens, the brightness of the exoplanet star temporarily decreases from an observer's perspective. Also, the mid-transit time of an exoplanet is when the exoplanet is directly in between its observer and its star. So the bottom of the graph. And um, our two main goals from this project were to detect exoplanets using the transit method and to determine the exoplanets mid-transit times. Now, as we calculated most of these uh, properties, there were a few main things that we were measuring. Firstly, there was flux and magnitude. Now, both flux and magnitude measure the brightness of astronomical sources, but they are a bit different. First of all, flux measures the brightness in watts per meter, while magnitude uses six magnitudes with the brightest at one and the faintest at six. A star at magnitude one is 100 times brighter than a star at magnitude six. Along with these me measurements comes uncertainty. The software, the software that we use calculates this uncertainty from external forces and creates a margin of error. Lastly, we measure the Julian date. The ju when measuring time, the Julian date system is more efficient because astronomers need to calculate and subtract and add dates, and the Gregorian calendar, which is what, you, what we normally use, isn't as efficient. Now, throughout the project, we studied three planets. Firstly, we studied WASP-104b. WASP-104b is a gas giant that orbits a G-type star. A G-type star is the fifth brightest star and is usually a yellow or yellow-white color due to its temperature. For example, our sun is an example of a class G star. Now, WASP-104b has a 1.8-day orbit around its star, and it is 0.02918 AU from its star. A and 1 AU equals 93 million miles. WASP-104b is also 466.4 light-years from Earth, and it was discovered in 2014 on the Kepler-2 mission. Now, the second planet we studied was Qatar 6b. Qatar 6b is also a gas giant exoplanet that orbits a K-type star. A K-type star is the sixth brightest star on the class system. Qatar 6b has a 3.5-day orbit. It is 0 0.0423 AU from its star. It is 329.4 light years from Earth, and it was discovered in 2017. In 2017, it was discovered using exoplanet transit, which is exactly what we did on this project. Now, lastly, we studied KPS-1b. It is also a gas giant planet, and it also, like Qatar 6b, orbits a K-type star. It has a 1.7-day orbit. It is 0 0.02269 AU from its star. It is 857 light years from Earth, and it was discovered in 2019, also due to transit, by an amateur astronomer who had was using CCD telescope, which is a very affordable and available telescope for most people to use. So let's talk about a little bit of exoplanet and star naming. So for stars, the naming convention utilized is Project Dash Number Indicating Discovery Order, 
And for exoplanets, the naming convention is host star name and then a lowercase letter indicating solar system discovery. Order. And this order is alphabetical starting at B. So for example, some examples of star names could be WASP-104, Qatar-6, or KPS-1. And exoplanet name examples are WASP-104b, Qatar-6b, and KPS-1b. So here's a more in-depth example of an exoplanet naming convention. convention. Um, on the left-hand side, it indicates that um, this was found in the WASP Wide Angle Search for Planets. In the middle, it indicates that it's the 104th to be found in the WASP. And B indicates that it's the first exoplanet to be discovered from its host star, WASP-104a. So why do we study exoplanets? There are three main reasons. First is to better understand how these systems formed and evolved. The second is to find out if and where life can exist on other planets. And the third is to give us insight into Earth and our own solar system. So here was our procedure for this project. So firstly, images were taken on telescopes. Second, these images were calibrated to reduce imperfections in the data. Third, the images were ran on AstroImage Today, which is an astro astronomical software. Fourth, this data from images were recorded using spreadsheets. Fifth, we made graphs from this data to indicate or show the transits. And sixth, calculations were made on topics such as mid-transit times. So the telescopes used were from the Southern Association for Research and Astronomy. Um, they can, the association consists of 15 colleges and universities. And then telescopes are remotely operated. There's several locations from Kitt Peak National Observatory, uh, Cairo Tololo, Roque de los Mochachos, and La Palma. Um, Calibration and exoplanet observation with Astro Image J. Calibration is changing the mag magnitude through observations, and it's essential when looking at images. It ensures removal of instrument biases and inconsistencies, leading to more reliable data. Astro Image J is a powerful software program used for analyzing astronomical images, including exoplanet observations. Um, key calibration and Key calibration processes include dark frame subtraction, which is eliminating thermal noise and dark current by subtracting dark frames, flat fielding, which is correcting for pixel to pixel sensitivity variations across the image, uh, bias frame correction, which is removing the electronic offset from the camera's detector, uh, hot pixel correction, which is cooling the telescope about 40 degrees less than the surrounding temperatures using liquid nitrogen, Calibration improves the precision and quality of light curves, enabling better detection of exoplanet transits variation, and variations in their brightness. Um, Astro Image J is a user-friendly interface uh, with automated tools making collaboration, tra calibration tran transect generation more accessible to researchers. Accurate calibrations and transect analysis play a vital role in advancing our understanding of exoplanets and their characteristics. So Astronomage J is a computer application that allows researchers, students, and alike to conduct experiments and study the universe. The program lets us interact with .fit files, which are like an image, but with interactive properties. They're flexible and allow for interoperable data transfer. Um, Astro Image J is actually an extension of an older Image J program, and the original Image J program was developed by the National Institute of Health for Biology, but astrono astronomers saw its value and repurposed it for their use. Astro adds astronomy plugins and macros and includes tools based on the Gaudigen Image J astronomical resources. So we use Astro Image J to process our .fit files for each solar system, um, basically the star and exoplanet in question. So apertures are placed on both target and comparison star, and then pre-designated magnitude of comparison star is entered, and then the target star magni magnitude will update, and then the Julian date is recorded, um, which is basically our x-axis. And then error is also recorded and shown as a scatter um, graph, and then 
successful result should have a dip in the middle. This shows that the light um, reaching from the, us from the star is being ever so slightly obscured by the exoplanet passing between. Yeah, so diving into our actual data, uh, our actual calculation was the mid uh, the mid transit time, which we did by estimating um, where, where we uh, can kind of tell is the beginning and the ending point of the transit time. Um, and then using that formula of beginning plus ending over two, um, we can find the midpoint, um, which should hopefully line up uh, with with the deepest part of the transit. So now we're going to show you some of our some of our calculations and our light curves. So here are our results. So this is the one from the last slide. This is WASP 104B, um, and and on the mid transit time that we got in Julian date was two four six zero zero one one point seven one two five. Uh, this is Qatar 6B. This is its transit graph. As you can see at the very end, um, it all kind of scatters a little bit. And we think that's because a cloud uh, went over the top of the telescope when it was observing. Um, and and its mid-transit time was 2460073.5825. And this is our final one that we did, which was KPS 1B. This is its transit graph. Um, as you can see, it's a little more shaky than the other ones, but there's still a clear transit there because the dip um, is still much more than all the air bars on all of our points. And the mid-transit time was 2460073.5825. And here are references. These are all of all the sources that we used in our research. And our slideshow template is from slides ago. Here are some of the highlights from our project. The four main highlights we thought were collaborating on graphs and troubleshooting, working with peers and mentors, working in a real world scenario with scientific images and learning about software applications such as Astro Image J. We'd also like to take a minute to thank everyone on this slide that helped us with this project directly or indirectly in any way. As mentioned earlier, one of our members on the team couldn't be here today and his name is Saul, and this is what he had to say about his experiences with the project. And you can pause and read if you would like to. CDS has enabled me to work with real astronomical data. This opportunity has solidified my desire to pursue a career in astrophysics. I'm beyond grateful for the um, work my mentor has put in and my experience in SEAS. As for mine, uh, having been passionate and interested in astronomy for years, the prospect of working as a team on a project with real telescope data sounded incredible. Um, SEAS opened my eyes to how fun and rewarding research and practical astronomy can be, and it has further uh, taught me how to work as a team and effectively collaborate with others. This NASA SEAS internship was a really unique and educational experience for me. I learned lots about exoplanets and scientific analysis. I'm really grateful to my mentor and peers for our work on this project, and thank you so much for this opportunity. Getting a chance to work with C's, my mentor and fellow interns with like interests on this project has really helped me grow. I built teamwork skills, gained some insight as to what it might feel like to work in a real team, and built upon my own knowledge of astronomy. I've always wanted to be an engineer, and this opportunity showed me a little of what it's like and is setting me up for success in a field that I'm passionate about. Working on this project was an amazing opportunity where I was able to work with people with like-minded interests and learn from NASA professionals. I especially loved combining my love of computers and astronomy and seeing how technology plays a huge role at NASA. It was a great experience and I hope to pursue something similar to this in the future. Now, personally for me, engineering has always been the clear choice for my future, but it was difficult to find opportunities in real world scenarios where I could understand what people, what engineers do day to day. And the SEAS internship program gave me a chance to actually work in astro astronomical engineering and see a part of what they do day to day. And I also got to see a part of my future. And I'm sure I speak for everyone when I say thank you for this opportunity.